So, hi everyone. <laughs> uh, I'm Vlad from Mellanox, now NVIDIA, and today I would like to give you an update on TC performance, uh, on performance of uh, control pass specifically. I will not be talking about data pass in this talk. So first, just to give you a quick recap. So I've been working on this for several years now, and uh, I have already presented, uh, initially presented this two net devs ago, and then give an update on upstream status of all of these patches on previous net dev in Prague. So this one is just a quick recap. If you would like more details, you, uh, I refer you to these previous talks from uh, TC workshops uh, from two previous net dev conferences. So first of all, CLS API filter update pass, uh, RTNA log dependency was removed from there. And uh, one single classifier, CLS flower, was converted to use internal fine-grained locking. Uh, so it's the only classifier, I think, which is unlocked now, and it's widely used uh, by, for hardware of loading. Uh, besides that, all of the actions were converted. Uh, uh, so it's all of them <laughs> in case of actions, uh, no pitfalls or anything. And drivers can now signal that they do not require CLS API to hold their channel log while calling their callback to a float or remove a floating of a filter. So that's just a quick recap. And today I would like to talk about some more challenges that I faced on further optimizations of performance of TC. Uh, so, first challenge is interaction between TC filter uh, add and delete also and the dump. So, uh, prior to 5.7 uh, flow action infrastructure code briefly obtained RTNL just in this small function TC setup flow action. Uh, internally, this function is very simple, it just three. I think we just lost Vlad again. Vlad, can you hear me? The lock removal from TC, and during that time, uh, I think Pablo from NetFilter, he wanted to have uh, hardware offload in for NetFilter, and he wanted to reuse TC for this. So he introduces uh, this kind of intermediate representation uh, to encode all the data from TC, which can also be used from NetFilter. And uh, when I upstreamed my stuff, I saw this function, I, uh, I saw that it's very simple, so I just decided to put RTNL lock internally around its code. Uh, but however, then we started testing on actual uh, virtual switch implementation and uh, the way virtual switches work is that usually they don't just set on remove flow, they also need to get the flow stats. And usually they do it concurrently because they're multi-threaded internally. So what uh, I observed is that uh, when virtual switch, uh, so initially we didn't know what's wrong because the uh, performance was good, but in actual uh, real life use cases, sometimes insertion rate dropped down significantly. And uh, when I started debugging, it turned out that uh, switch initiates uh, dump of all filters concurrently. And uh, the way dump is implemented in uh, TC is that it fully dependent on RTNL log. So basically when dump is executed, it obtains RTNL log. filter add and uh, delete uh, task, they have to wait for this RTNL log, even though they only need it for very brief moment of time, just to read several f data fields from action implementation. So this resulted significant log contention, especially when there were several dump threads in virtual switches. And uh, I would like to show you a flame graph on this. So I know that most of the people here are probably quite familiar with flame graph, but just maybe uh, for people who are not that familiar, just want to remind that uh, flame graph uh, on uh, uh, vertical axis, uh, it's basically a call stack uh, and the caller is on the bottom and the Kali is on the top. So this guy TC calls libc send message, which calls entry syscall. Uh, and uh, horizontally, it's uh, 
uh, each width of each bar represents uh, how many samples were obtained by profiler. Basically, how much CPU time uh, did each function took. So here we can see that uh, uh, flower change calls flower hardware flow to replace filter, which calls the TC setup flow action. And we can zoom in. And uh, all this TC setup flow action does, it, it just spins on RTNL mutex because uh, it contends for other uh, add and delete uh, threads and also with dump thread, which uh, monopolizes RTNL log for quite some amount of time up till uh, netlink packet size is fully filled with filter data. So, uh, so solution was quite simple to just uh, finish the job and fully remove RTNL log dependency from this particular function. And it was not the challenging to do because all actions, as I said before, were already converted to use their own internal fine-grained logs, uh, TCFA log, which is per action. Uh, and uh, I used it instead of requiring global RTNL log. And of course, I had to fix uh, several small issues, like uh, some of the functions that were called by this function were sleeping, and TCFA log is spin log, and RTNL log is mutex, so we cannot sleep while holding TCFA log, but it was minor. And uh, it resulted significant uh, performance improvement when running uh, TC filter update and uh, dump concurrently. Uh, I no longer observe uh, almost uh, any kind of degradation of insertion rate while running concurrent filter dump. Uh, particularly only if I uh, dump and uh, update same classifier instance at the same time, it results slight contention of internal flower logs. But it's uh, not uh, like before drop down in insertion rate was in hundreds of percent and now the total price might be uh, five percent in my tests. So I'm quite satisfied with this result. Another challenge was actually per CPU allocator. So all actions, not, not all, like most of the actions internally use per CPU allocator for stats. Uh, and uh, the way per CPU allocator works is that internally it's synchronized by single global mutex, not RTNL, but dedicated mutex, but still it's uh, global. It's shared by all per CPU users. Uh, and uh, another problem is that uh, per CPU allocator memory usage grows linearly with number of CPUs because it has to allocate some amount of memory per uh, each CPU in system. So while it's great for data pass performance, it's not that great for control pass performance and memory usage. Uh, so here is a flame graph of uh, filter update uh, when uh, per CPU allocator is, use, is uh, being used for stats. And uh, here we see flower change calls uh, actions in it. And uh, here in this case, I use two most used actions in my case. One is tunnel key action and another is mirrored action. And uh, we can see that both of them consume significant amount of uh, resources by per CPU allocator. For example, we can zoom out, zoom in here and see per CPU alloc uses a lot of uh, time. And also most of the time is again spent just spinning on mutex because uh, one single global mutex is highly contended. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, I wanted to allow users to fix this, to choose which uh, stats implementation uh, they want, uh, because uh, even though per CPU allocator uh, uses uh, a lot of memory and is slow on control pass, it's, it's quite fast for data pass. So it's very beneficial for people who don't use hardware float. And actually it was implemented as a performance optimization, so I couldn't just uh, remove it. Uh, instead, I, I decided to implement a flag uh, that allows user to control it. Uh, so the flag name is flag no per CPU stats. <laughs> the name was uh, discussed a lot uh, in mailing list because I wanted to make it generic uh, since it's not only user of per CPU in actions. But we will get to that uh, in, uh, in problems that we still have as of now. And uh, Okay, so 
uh, when user does, does not request to have this per CPU allocator, regular integers are used and are synchronized with the same per action fine-grained lock. And uh, the good news for me <laughs> was that uh, such uh, infrastructure already existed uh, from before, from before per CPU allocator was introduced. And uh, since uh, some of the actions are still not converted to per CPU allocator, uh, they're still using the infrastructure. So I just changed all the actions to use either per CPU or uh, this uh, old uh, regular integers for stats counting. And uh, it resulted significant impact on insertion rate, increased from 30 to 120% in my tests. And uh, actually, I'm only testing with one or two actions, but uh, uh, CLS API supports attaching up to what 32 actions per, uh, per filter. So the more actions that use per CPU allocator you have, the more you will be impacted by uh, uh, by this, so it's quite, but even with single action, it's still 30 to 50%, so it's quite significant. And this allowed to improve, first of all, memory usage, because the total of all per CPU stats is around 52 bytes, plus some metadata. And this calculation also matched what I observed uh, on real system. So you can see that with current uh, multi-core servers, uh, like now you can have, I don't know, hundreds of uh, CPUs in systems, so it will be quite significant. And uh, I also would like to give you updates on current NetNext performance and current challenges that uh, we are still facing even after this update. So this is a flame graph uh, obtained on current NetNext. Uh, I did it this week. So as you can see, there are still some mutex contention and uh, it's mainly in IDR. So IDR now becomes a bottleneck. Uh, we are using IDR in both uh, flower and in, uh, in actions. So actually when I insert one filter with several action, I need to update uh, flower IDR plus uh, IDR per action. So it's a lot and it becomes a bottleneck. Another bottleneck is the DST cache. It's specific to tunnel key action, but uh, it still impacts us because tunnel key action is, in my opinion, like most, maybe not most used action after uh, GACT and Miret, but it's heavily used. And DST cache, we can zoom in internally again, it uses per CPU allocation which uh, becomes a bottleneck. And here I obtain this flame graph with TC only, but for example, when using it together with OpenV switch, OpenV switch internally also uses uh, in its kernel data pass per CPU allocation, which results even more contention. So uh, per, CPU is, per CPU allocator is a problem all around when used uh, in high performance control pass. Uh, so the, these are two main bottlenecks, IDR and per CPU. Besides this, we also see not filter notification, which consumes uh, like what almost uh, seven and a half percent. But I'm not sure that we can really do something about it because uh, I cannot just disable it. Uh, I mean, other users, uh, user in systems might, might be dependent on this notification for something. So uh, currently I don't see a way to somehow remove on, or lift this restriction with the filter notify. Yes, yeah, so here I just reiterate the main bottlenecks and uh, IDR. So I looked into IDR API. I thought that maybe there are some knobs there for me to play with, to configure, but it doesn't seem to be very configurable. So if anyone has any experience with tuning IDR or knows how its performance can be improved, the suggestions are very welcome. Because if you look at flame graph again, we see that IDR it significant, significantly impacts our insertion rate here and here for every action. Also for filter change, I think we should also see it somewhere here. Maybe it's dwarfed by other calls. Uh, so anyway, that's the update. It's, I guess it's time for questions. <laughs> okay, so for, for questions, uh... If you can, okay, we're not going to force anybody to turn on their video, but if you can, just uh, raise your hand. Let's try the two models. You can type the question on the chat, on the chat, 
you can raise your hand. I can see your hand. Uh, and uh, th then you turn on your video and you speak. Uh, so let's let's take the questions now. Of Vlad. Anybody on the chat, maybe? Okay, so waiting for that, maybe I'll ask you a question, Vlad. So it sounds to me like your solution to get rid of the past CPU allocation, basically, you, you bypass it. What, could you not have fixed the past CPU allocator itself as opposed to, uh, you know, avoiding it? Yes, yeah, some of the things might be fixed, like, for example, the global log, but the memory usage itself, I think it's uh, inherent to design, because if you want to have per CPU memory, you need to allocate memory, which is linear to number in, of CPUs in system, right? There is no way around that. So even if you could uh, do something with performance, uh, memory usage, uh, in my opinion, is not really fixable. Uh, also, I don't think it's heavily used for any performance stuff because, for example, like a year ago, maybe more, we encountered significant degradation in sortion rate and culprit apparently was some very small change. Uh, Eric Dumazet sets some kind of uh, alignment, change at alignment for a structure and uh, it completely resulted some kind of corner case in per CPU and uh, I had to report it to per CPU allocator people. Uh, so I don't even believe that anyone else uses it for anything that requires high performance on control pass. So I think it would be quite painful for these people if I go into their code and, you know, try to make it fast while it's, it's, oh, it's no, it was not never designed to be. So Eric is, I think, is here. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't Eric's fault. He just said right. some alignment of some field. It was CPU per CPU allocator fault, basically. Yeah, but what, what if I want to use stats and do control? Basically, uh, it won't work, right? If I wanted the stats. You, you're doing this for, uh, for the benefit of hardware offload, basically, because if you're offloading to hardware, the stats are in hardware, so you really don't want to use the CPU data. Yeah, but stats uh, still work. You just use regular integers. So you can create, it. theoretically, if you want, you can create a filter with action without per CPU stats and stats will continue to work. You will just observe degradation of uh, that data pass performance. Okay, so Marcello has raised his hand. Uh, you, you, if you want to go on video, Marcello, please go ahead. If you want to type the question, I can read it or live can read it as well. All right, Hi. read is fine. Hi, Vlad. Um, Hi, Marcelo. On, on the new filter notification, uh, it dumps the stats together with it. Have you considered not dumping just the stats because they are zero anyway, right? It's a new filter, at least for that moment. Hmm. I did not. Maybe it's a good idea. But uh, then again, how can we ensure that uh, any software and system, d like it, yes, there is no point on reading the stats, but may maybe people reuse code or something. Would not we just break user space? Some obscure corner case when someone for some reason <laughs> checks that stats are present. That's my main concern with such changes. Maybe it's more question to Jamal. <laughs> can we do that? No, I think you can, you can break user space. You will break user space, you're right. Because uh, people are expecting stats and now you remove. But if it's an optional thing, it means if I specify an option, the old code will not use this option. Should it? I think it may work, actually. I don't know what other people think. Don't specify the command, uh, specify a specific netlink attribute which says, I don't want the stats. And then old user code will never ask for this. And therefore, it's still going to get the stats. Yeah, but Maybe. the notification is a broadcast, right? Oh, you're talking about notifi uh, uh, e events as opposed to uh, request response? Yeah, when, yeah. A, mm -hmm. when a new filter is added, it's broadcasted that this new filter is added. So you can monitor it using TC monitor and Meanwhile, OVS still works because it's a broadcast. Yeah, we're talking about this guy, the filter notify. 
Yeah, but that um, okay. Right, so that won't work here, right? I thought you you're doing the dump. Yeah, dump uh, is already quite optimized to just dump okay. uh, the counters without anything else. Mm -hmm. So anybody else with questions for Vlad? We can always come back at the end. We'll have a few more minutes. Hey, Jamal, I have a quick question. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yep. So uh, who is this? Uh, this is Kiran. Uh, hey, Kiran. Uh, hey, Lad, so uh, I saw that uh, the lock removal and that is improved the performance. Do we have an absolute number with respect to the filter add from each core, how much it is improved? So let's say if it was uh, 50K, I'm just picking a number. Now, did it become like 100K, 200K, uh, you know, something like that? And does it scale? Hello? Lad? Uh, yes, sorry. Is, is question being asked in chat? I, I no. Uh, it, it, uh, you can't hear, Kira? Yeah. No. So. Okay, I'll repeat the question. He's, he's asking for numbers, if you have numbers. Uh, what was the... Uh, you showed percentage, but what numbers uh, do you have? Did I, did I say that correctly, Kira? Yes, that's right. Oh, do we have that? Yes, yeah, so number? in this presentation... I specifically did not include numbers because uh, now they're heavily dependent on which uh, filter, uh, which uh, traffic profile do you try to parse. Like basically how many actions do you have and uh, it uh, linear uh, to number of actions attached to your filter. So on my system with uh, 10 uh, TC tasks, I get uh, around uh, uh, 200,000 plus uh, rules per second uh, add or delete with um, more simple rules. And the more rules I get, the, it goes down to 100,000 rules per second. And but it's is... heavily dependent on how many actions do you have Correct. per rule. And this is a collective uh, from all 10 TC task. This is a co collective number, right? 200K. Uh, so, so I guess you can't hear you. I have to be the bridge. Um, yeah. So is, is this, uh, repeat that question again. Is this a collective number for across all 10 TC tasks? Right, so this, okay, is this the aggregate uh, value for all the 10 TC tasks or just for part yes. one? Yes, it's total. aggregated. It's yeah, a sum, total. yeah? Yeah. It's a sum, he says. Okay. So I, I don't know why he can't hear you. Uh, we may have to talk to the oh, AV guys. But anyways, I, I, if you guys don't mind. Uh, Julian, are you there? Yes, I'm Julian? indeed. Okay. So uh, uh, if there's one more question, we'll take it. Otherwise, we can move to the next session. It's because just to try and maintain the time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, Jim. Uh, hi, Vlad. I have one more question. Hi. So uh, have you, this is Sridhar here. Have yes, you collected sure. any data while running OVS with TC Flower offload? So basically there we have ads as well as dumps happening in parallel, right? So how does that behave in that scenario? Uh, how does filter update uh, impact and, concurrent dumps? Yeah, that, when we, that happens when we do OVS kernel offload, right? Yeah. So uh, right now, as I described uh, at the beginning of presentation, uh, it's uh, concurrent dump uh, does not significantly impact the rule update anymore. Okay. So basically, we should be able to get around 200k per second, even when dumping. So it depends on hardware which you are floating to, because uh, like uh, on you are asking on Mellanox hardware. Because when you do hardware offload, the, the bottleneck becomes a driver mostly. Okay. Okay. Um, thanks, Vlad. I guess we. Uh, I don't know if we can clap for you, but uh, applaud your efforts. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So uh, my name is uh, uh, Ronnie Boyanai from uh, Nvidia. I'm uh, here to present uh, an idea we have of extending the TC with uh, five-tuple hash offload. This is the work of me and also Ronnie Ephraim. 
And also I want to thank uh, Ariel Levkovich, uh, which is not appearing here in the title. So first uh, I'm going to talk about a uh, programmable uh, data plane. Um, if what it is and about uh, TC, how TC can be used to, to implement this uh, programmable data plane concept. And when we have TC, we also uh, have a TC other offload and uh, I'm going to do some recap about it. Um, as it already exists uh, uh, in, in, the, in the kernel. And we just want to extend it. Then for the specific use case of hashing, I'm going to explain a little bit about ECMP. ECMP is the, the main use case here, but we have a lot of other more general, general, generalized uh, use case for it. And last, uh, we focused a little bit about the details. Uh, uh, offloading hash uh, has some uh, pitfalls uh, on synchronizing between the, the data plane and the control plane, and uh, we talk about it. Okay, so about TC and TC offload and programmable data plane. So the concept of uh, programmable data plane is uh, think driven from the, from the understanding that <coughs> when we have a flow, let's say you have a cloud and you have a web server and someone is trying to access the web server and, and download the page, the first packet that will arrive, it will be a packet with uh, an underlay, uh, which uh, uh, carried uh, the packet uh, on the infrastructure of the cloud. Maybe it, be, it will be VXLAN, Geneva, or other uh, tunneling. Uh, the first thing that will be done on the host after receiving the packet is understanding, uh, understanding which uh, VM uh, or, or which port basically this uh, uh, packet belong to and it probably strip the packet from the VXLAN and we forward it to the next phase. The next phase can be, uh, for example, connection tracking. Uh, if you have a security groups, you want to, uh, some, to have uh, some uh, um, window validation or just to, uh, to make sure that connection is coming in and not coming out. Um, and, and, and last, you uh, probably have a NAT because uh, usually uh, there is a use of a different IPs uh, locally. So the first packet, uh, we have a series of steps that we need to take. But uh, after we understand this tag, this is, uh, this is the first packet in, in a stream of packet because when we download the page, uh, we're probably uh, going to download content. It will open a data, a, a TCP flow and, and will download the, um, uh, the data itself. It will be stream of packets. But after the, the first few packets, we can say that the, the, the flow is now uh, deterministic. We have a, some kind of execution pipeline that, we, that, is, that will not change during the, the lifetime of this uh, flow. And this is uh, where a uh, programmable data plane uh, comes in. We can express it, uh, the, 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 termini the deterministic uh, part, we can express uh, with um, a concept of uh, tables and rules. Uh, the programmable data plane have uh, tables, each table has an ID, and for in each table we have uh, rules. Each rule is consisted of uh, matches and actions. Match can be, uh, usually it will be a part of the, of the packet. Uh, fields like the IP address, the MAC addresses, if it's tunnel, it can be VNI and, and so on. It can also be a metadata. For example, after we strip the packet, and the metadata itself is still kept uh, somewhere and we can compare it uh, when, when the processing uh, continue. Uh, other actions can be modify the header. Uh, for example, when, when we have NAT, we will modify the source IP or destination IP port and so on. <coughs> and last is steering uh, actions. Steering actions means that uh, we can tell uh, what is the next table in the pipeline that we need uh, to, to execute. Or it could be, if this is the last table, uh, we can take a decision about uh, forwarding the packet to, to the VM, to the, uh, where it will be handled and given to the web service in this case, in this example, or we can take another action of drop and, and so on. So we have a, a control plan, which is, uh, can be more complex um, that learn the, the first flow and be configured with, like we have with SDN controller, or maybe open flow. And we have a very simple data plan and, and the data plane is, is simple. It means that we can um, implement it also in, uh, in hardware. 
okay, so a few years ago, uh, and the community started uh, to uh, to implement this kind of, um, okay, let, let's start with the beginning. TC is existing for a long time, but TC was chosen as the, the right tool of um, implementing programmable data plan uh, with also hardware uh, offload support. The reason for that is that this is first in line uh, except XDP and um, and it already has a lot of uh, a classifier from this classifier uh, TC flowers chosen because it has a very uh, flexible key structure that you can extend and you can express a lot of um, matches, different matches uh, with this key. And TC already has a lot of uh, different actions uh, that uh, can be used for the steering, for the steering or for modifying a packet. So it has very expressive uh, uh, language, you can say, and it's also um, a Linux tool and it also vendor agnostic. So um, you can implement using the TC, you can implement a programmable data, a data plane uh, using the TC software only. And if you have a NIC that support hardware offload, this, um, those rules that you configure can be offloaded and packet will be handled complete, completely in hardware. So here is an example. This is, a, I think, a very famous one. How, how you add a flow for Vixen Decap. Okay, you see that they, they, we configure a TCA a flower a rule a, for matching the destination mark, source mark, a source IP and destination IP of the tunnel itself. And also there, there is the destination port in this case, 4789, which is the, the um, default uh, Vixlan. And there is the VNI, which is a 16 in this case. And uh, the action is a decap unset the, the tunnel. And the next action is sent to the VM. So packets with this VNI, with VNI 16 from this source, uh, IP and destination IP will go to this spot. <clears throat> of course, th this is a very simple rule. There is no uh, next table, but uh, TC also has, has a go to chain, uh, which can be which can express a table. <clears throat> so um, there is a lot of benefit in offloading later the, the the data plan, and the benefit is mainly performance. Here is a simple uh, example uh, we tested. Um, this is a, a test that we uh, did a VXLAN with the connection tracking with two, uh, two uh, 100,000 flows. 200,000 flows mean we had uh, different uh, TCP and UDP sessions concurrently when we run packet from each flow. Like uh, this is the, the worst case. There is, there is, uh, there's a, a cache miss for each uh, packet. As you can see, the, the the, the number of packets uh, you can reach um, using also the 27 million packets per second. <clears throat> Doing that with the uh, software, um, um, let's say software uh, with connection tracking, a core can do maybe 500K, even less. This depends with hyper, this is a core without hyperthread, with hyperthread it's, it's half. So uh, this is also a lower, uh, I'm, I'm giving a, a higher rate than, than we saw, but you can see that for yourself that for pushing 27 million packets per second, you, you will have to use at least 54 calls. And th those are host calls that can be used for other purposes. When you're doing offload, you use zero CPU cycles for pushing this traffic. Of course, you also have the, the control uh, part that you need the, to learn the first flow. Okay, you have the part that you learn and the part that you configure. But after you, after you configure, everything run in, in hardware. So you have to maybe invest two or three cores for the control and all the rest is done in hardware. So this is the benefit. Um, okay. <clears throat> now we go for, for uh, the ECMP. So I just want to check the time. Um, so ECMP equal cost multipath. Okay, this is a very uh, uh, known uh, uh, problem. Uh, you have a network, we have uh, multiple routers, and you have uh, uh, two nodes that are connecting between them. There's the source and destination, and the packet can go through router A, router B, or router C. Uh, from L3 perspective, this is the same uh, distance, the same number of hops, so it, it, all, are, all are considered as the best path. Um, 
if we would choose just one of them, uh, for example, always go, go to router A and we have other nodes, this is of course, of course a very simplified um, uh, drawing. The, we'll have a much more, we'll have a lot of nodes. And if, for example, uh, another uh, source will choose also router A, uh, we will get router A uh, pushing all the traffic and router B and C will not see any packet. So to achieve much better utilization uh, with equal cost multipass, in this case, we split the traffic. We send some of the traffic to router A, some to the B, and some to C. <clears throat> um, when we do that, we have to, to make sure that packets arrive on the same order that they, they were sent, at least for the same session. Okay, if we have a, C, a TCP session, we cannot send some of the packet to router A and some, some to B because on a, an, on a local time, uh, there might be a different load on, on the routers. So router A might have different latency. It will be more loaded than router B. So packets might arrive out of order. Um, if, if this is only a one, two packets or a very short time, it might not affect TCP, but uh, if, if we have a lot of uh, reorders, TCP might consider this as packet loss. And when you have packet loss, there, there are uh, retransmissions of packets and the throughput is, is uh, dropping. And of course, we don't want that. Uh, UDP uh, doesn't have uh, data ordering, but uh, when we look at protocols that are using UDP on top of it, uh, it's also required. For example, if you have RTP and you have a, a video or, or, or a voice and you start to get packets out, out of order, it will affect the quality, um, jitter. And if you have uh, also there are protocols like uh, Google Quick that are completely uh, like TCP. It uses the, uh, UDP as the underlayer, but the protocol itself has retransmission, has sequence, has congestion uh, control, and, and so on. So we must keep uh, the order on, on both UDP and TCP. <clears throat> so how we do that? That. Um, the most simple way of doing that, or the first thing that com comes in mind is that you build a table and when you have a new flow, you look at that table and uh, you, you look for the, this five tuple. If you find this five tuple, you know what is the node. If not, you allocate uh, the next node, maybe in round uh, robin and, and keep it. And the uh, following packets, uh, um, uh, you will look. You will look up for the five tuple, and you find the same node. Of course, this is uh, not an, a very performance or very effective uh, method of doing that because you have to keep all this formation. You have to uh, now uh, do aging uh, on the on the, um, on the flows because some of the flows uh, will not terminate uh, normally. Also, for UDP, you don't have termination at all. Um, if there is a change in the network, you now have to scan all the, um, the entries in the table and find the table that uh, are uh, related to the node that was changed and, and update them. This is not efficient. A much better uh, method or much uh, more resilient method of doing that is like um, <clears throat> similar to hash table. We do the hash calculation in separate. We have the packet. We calculate hash on five tuple. We have a number. We're doing a, a bit mask on that now and jump to one of, of, the, of the buckets. We have a list of buckets or array of buckets. And in each bucket, we have what is the next action. In ECMP, it will go, it will, you will go to the next node by probably setting the MAC address, the right MAC address and, uh, and sending to the wire. Um, for other use cases, you might choose to do something else. So uh, with this method, you have the, the same consistency because each flow will always go to the same bucket. Uh, you don't need to save anything beside the bucket uh, themselves and it would be a small number. Even if we would, uh, as we see, uh, we, will use, we will use a, an array of buckets. It's, it's probably 256, maybe more, <clears throat> but um, it's a very small number. If you need an update, so you update 10 buckets, 20 buckets, it's not like uh, updating uh, thousands of flows. There is no aging and so on. Uh, so it's much more simple. Here is an example um, of how we can implement the hashing with, with this uh, hash method. Okay, we have a list of, uh, of packets. Consistent hash means that if you have uh, a change 
change in the hash affects only uh, k divided by n of the of the entries in the hash. Okay, um, it would try to be as consistent as possible. The more nodes you have, uh, uh, the less entries that will be affected by by a change. Uh, you, you want that most of the of the entries will, will remain the same. So in consistent hashing, uh, we have your node D, and let's say there is a update in the in the network, and node D is now uh, removed. What you need to do is to update all the backets that has node D and change it to a, to another node. This means that all the green backets, node A, B, and C, will remain the same. We will not have packet reorder, and we will not have any effect on, on the traffic. <coughs> and uh, instead of node D, we'll choose other nodes. Uh, probably better to do it in a balanced way. So uh, here we see that the first one was replaced by node A, second by node B, and third by node C. Of course, the high uh, number of buckets uh, will enable you also to have weights. You can allocate 70% of the buckets for node A and 30% of the buckets for the rest, and, and so on. When you add a new uh, node, let's say there's another update on the network and you want to, to, uh, to add a new node, uh, you have to choose which bucket you change. Here uh, we took three buckets, one from A, one from B, and one from C. And now uh, th uh, there we go to node uh, E, the new node, and uh, only this traffic uh, will change. So uh, it will not prevent uh, reorder, but the reorder happens on network update and only for a very uh, short time, uh, the, the transition time. And the assumption that Removing and adding node, nodes in network is much slower than uh, the, the rate that you open session and close session and, and slow duration. So we can uh, generalize uh, EC, uh, this hashing and have a much more uh, complex or so other use cases uh, that uh, will use the, the, the hash. Uh, here is an example, we want to do uh, redundancy. So uh, we have a VM number one and VM number two that are sending traffic. The host is, is, uh, has two routers uh, connected to him, active, active, um, and, and doing a hash and, and choosing router A and router B according to the hash. If one of the routers is going down, it, it will update the buckets and that the, the traffic would be uh, diverted to the active one. Um, the VM, has no idea about that. This is an infrastructure, and also it, uh, you don't need a special uh, feature or something like that. You just can program the data plane uh, to do it easily. And there are the use cases like service. If you if we look on a you know, higher um, level, you can have uh, 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 servers, and uh, on on congestion time or busy time, you might want to um, add more VMs. And, and you need to split the traffic between them. So you have a gateway and when you add VMs, you add uh, more, bucket, um, or more buckets or update the buckets to uh, direct uh, the traffic to more uh, nodes to, to handle the traffic. Okay, there are, there are other uh, use cases. So the hashing uh, can be general, ge generalized and used in other uh, cases as well. So uh, we talked about what is a programmable data plane, about the TC and then TC hardware offload and, and its benefits. We talked about ECMP and hashing in, in general. And now uh, we want, uh, want to present uh, how we can extend TC um, to support that. So the initial, initial uh, suggestion is uh, adding a dedicated uh, hash action. Uh, this would be a new new action in TC, and, and the action uh, will uh, calculate hash on the, on the five tuple. I will talk about which hash you can say, the, which hash uh, are you going to calculate, what is the hash function. Um, and we put the, the result in the SKB hash. And the other side of it is the, is the bucket itself. So the bucket can be implemented by TC flower. Or you go to chain number two. Okay, the first TC will calculate the hash and will jump to the hash table, which is chain two. In chain two, uh, we will have a match on the hash itself. So uh, in this case, the bit mask is for the last four bits. We have 16 buckets. In this case, it will go to bucket number one. 
Um, and if you go to action to packet number one, the, in this case, the action will be uh, redirect the packet to to, to this to the to this interface. However, um, we have a problem with the hash function itself. Um, since we have a control plane and data plane or programmable data plane, and if we have hardware offload, it's another layer. And uh, the question is how. What, which, what hash are, are we going to use? Um, the control plane might, might choose one hash because it was written before this feature because um, it's very effective uh, hash for this use case. I don't know what is the reason. The hardware uh, probably have its own hash because a hash for hardware is usually different than software because um, because of efficiency, there's, there are some hashes that are more efficient other that you want to implement and of course the software might change its ha its hashing so uh, for example in the linux uh, usually use a jenkins hash uh, for the last uh, i don't know 10 years 15 years and it might be that in the future someone will create a better hash that they have uh, that will be double the performance uh, reduced by half the time it takes to execute or the cycles it takes to execute the hashing and everything will start to use this hash. So the hash itself, it's a problem because we have diff different components that are going to use this hash. And, and why is it is a problem in this case? Here we have an example. In, in SDN, there are two use cases. The, the, the simple use case that is you, you know your programmable data plane in advance, it's all static and you can configure everything before you see the first packet. In this case, you don't have a problem because hash is always calculated in the, in the hardware or, or in the data plane and, and, and there will be no uh, sync problem. But in, in use case where you have a SDN, usually in SDN controller you have uh, rules and it's very dynamic because uh, you're migrating VMs, uh, VMs are going down, going up, everything changes. Uh, all the time. So usually the data plane is uh, empty on start and when you see traffic, the first traffic you see and you don't have, you don't, the data plane has no rule to, to what to do with this packet, the packet will go to the control and the control will consult with the configuration that can be open flow or, or other uh, specific implementation and it will generate uh, the pipeline, the data plane pipeline. So if we follow this uh, and, 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 and see uh, what happens, the first packet will not match in hardware because uh, there is no buckets or, uh, or in TC. If we go to software, the software will calculate some kind of hash and for the software the result was it is going to bucket number zero. Now it generates the data plane configuration, the data plane configuration uh, is done and the next packet will hit the, the data plane. Now there is, an, there is a hash and, and the result is different because there is a different hash in the data plane. So here it, uh, it hit a, a bucket uh, number, uh, number two and there is no rule in, in bucket number two. So it will go into the software or to control plane. So in the control plane, we, we calculate again the hash and we hit bucket number zero. And this will not converge. And the result of this is that your data plane is not, the programmable data plane is not configured correctly and you see all the traffic in the control. And the control is the slowest uh, path in, in, in the system. Okay, it's more complex uh, and this is why it's more slow and the data play is simple and fast and in this case we cannot use it. So what is the solution that uh, uh, we are suggesting? <clears throat> um, there's a very nice thing in the kernel that's called the eBPF or BPF and you can provide a code that runs on, on, the, on the packet and can do a lot of stuff. One of them is calculating hash. You can implement any hash or any common hash that we have CRC or Anna Jenkins or, or, or I don't know, uh, the common hash that, uh, that are used. You can implement it with, uh, with, with this code and you can provide it 
איזה EPF code או BPF, BPF code uh, together with the, uh, with the uh, data plane and the, and the control plane configuration. So you will have the same hash, the hash is defined, um, and now a dash is defined as a, as a BPF code, and it depends if you're doing, for example, hardware offload, um, the hardware can, or the driver of, of the hardware can provide you the right uh, function that is, is, is used. For hardware, you will not be able to change how the hardware behave, but the hardware can supply a BPF code that can calculate the same hashing, exactly the same hashing as the hardware. So once you do that, and, and if, if you have a miss in your software, you run the, the eBPF or the BPF code um, in software, and, and the result will be that you will have the hash number or the result in the SKB hash, and it will go to bucket number two. You configure the hardware, and now, uh, okay, and now when after you configured the first packet in that will be would, that will be matched in hardware, uh, will calculate the exact same hash function, and as a result, it will go the, to the exact same packet, and we have a synchronization between uh, the hardware and and the software. Okay, so uh, we suggest to to extend the hash, and besides saying that this is a hash, uh, we also provide um, how to calculate it. Okay, so in case of hardware offload, you will take it from the from the from the driver. Uh, in other use cases, uh, it uh, it can be a, a way to sync. You can sync the software and the TC to do the same. Maybe your software is old and is doing another kind of uh, hashing, so you can provide the same hashing to the C TC also in software that you will calculate the exact same hash, and and this solves the the sync problem. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, to summarize, uh, we talked about programmable data plane as, as a concept and, uh, as, as, and about TC, how TC can be the right tool of doing that and, and even more, uh, TC can be used as a hardware offload uh, tool and, and, and the programmable data plane can be offloaded to the hardware and the benefit of that, which is uh, offloading the packet forwarding and tunneling to the hardware and, and, and giving the cycles to the host that they, they can be used uh, for virtual machine or for anything else beside the packet forwarding. Um, we explained a little bit about hash use cases when the first uh, hash, with the first use case is ECMP, but there are other use cases. The suggested way of solving ECMP can be used in other use cases like uh, redundancy and service load balances and, and probably other stuff. Um, we presented uh, how we're going to extend, we suggest to, to extend TC uh, to support this kind of hash, hash and, and the problem, the sync, the sync challenge when you do that because you have hardware or data plane um, hash, and, and it might be different than the software hash. And the way for solve that, uh, we suggest that we use eBPF uh, to sync this, uh, uh, this hash. Um, the NetDev conference should have been a few months ago, but uh, we didn't wait. So the patches are now uh, discussed in the community. Uh, the main uh, re rejection that we hear is about uh, that they, there is already uh, eBPF um, action, so we can use that. This is, of course, true, and it, it's also true for other stuff. We can do a lot of stuff with the uh, BPF, and, and there are uh, actions, uh, specific actions for that. I guess that the um, it's a trade-off be uh, uh, between giving the user the expressiveness because it's much, much more easy to configure TC hash and, and know what you are doing, uh, <coughs> uh, comparing to uh, providing eBPF code. But um, 
And this is the, the trade-off, and this is currently discussed in the community. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Hey, Jamal, I have a question. This is Anjali. Oh, hi, Anjali. Uh, so the question is, uh, maybe I missed, but is there a way to specify the seed for the hash as well, like the key? Um, uh, you know, not just uh, the five tuple. Um, and then the other question um, is, uh, I mean, as I understood, the, the, the BPF hook is to align the software hash algorithm with the hardware one. Um, can I get the answers for those? So I, I don't know, is Ron in here? Anybody from Mellanox who worked on this? No, I, I can give you my point of view from what I understood. Would that help? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, we, we'll make up some theories about what he's trying to say. <laughs> so uh, my understanding is um, the, there is you, the software in, in, the, in the kernel has to be aware of what's being offloaded in the hardware. Correct. Right? In order for the hash to work and um, effectively um, hash correctly, so you can you can you can pick the the, the correct uh, values, right? Um, and so I, I suspect that part of that uh, uh, policy definition will include this this uh, seed you, des you described. That, that's just a suspicion. I have no. Uh, so the patches were posted. And it seems that like there's a variety of hash algorithms, and some of them were to be expressed using T eBPF because uh, they may not have made a lot of sense for software. Yeah. Anybody else wants to chime in? Uh, uh, sorry, Marcelo raised his hand. Hey, Jamal. Uh, as I was asking on the chat, uh, one question would be, if this BPF object needs to be in sync with the hardware, who would be distributing it? Would It would be distributed together with the driver, with the next firmware, or how? Because they need to be maintained, right? It's always a problem with BPF, right? I mean, uh, it's not really part of upstream kernel. It may be, there may be a sample code in, uh, in uh, tools testing or uh, samples BPF, but um, that, that's why I like these uh, uh, simple things like this to be part of the kernel upstream, right? So uh, um, I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. With you. But but I think it's a generic problem. It's not just uh, this scenario, but uh, uh, but possibly. Um, yeah, but a BPF the thing in this case is that we need to have it in sync with the NIC and more specifically with the NIC firmware. So we need to know what the NIC is capable so that we can use that specific BPF file with it. It's hardware dependent. Yeah. Th right. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I believe so. Uh, the same thing, Jamal. That it is. You know, you have to know what is Nick using for you to match it up in the BPF program. Mm -hmm. There was one more question. Uh, you know, related to this, which was about hash balancing. So what I understood is the hash balancing. Uh, you know, it's more resilient hash balance that is being done. But I couldn't uh, gather if there was a way for, uh, you know, the, you know, for from software to actually do the hash balancing themselves, you know, um, through whatever uh, scripts or whatever they want to use. Like, like in each tool, we do have the hash that's exposed. Uh, I'm not sure that is the case here. So you're talking about RSS hashing in this case, or? Yeah, yeah, RSS hashing. So I mean, any hash will have their uh, lookup table that you can, the buckets that you could expose to balance mm -hmm. either uh, through the user space or, you know, you assume a balancing either in the driver or in the hardware. So I, I couldn't gather if it was completely configurable or it was something uh, that was not. It, it sounded to me like there's multiple ways you can do hashing in the hardware. 
right and you so whoever is setting policy in software so he, he has my understanding right and like uh, and uh, i'm hoping that's how it works is somebody in user space will configure the hardware to do a hash and set the skb hash so when it arrives in software in the kernel you already know what let's say 1 2 3 4 means right right and then you can classify on one, two, three, four, and the approach was to classify using uh, flower. So you can say TC flower match hash one, two, three, four, run these extra actions in, 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 in the kernel. But the hardware would have tagged that hash. Uh, and you could control that, and there's multiple ways that that hash would be created in the hardware. And uh, I, I think the attributes of how you download that is the example unfortunately provided was not very good. It just said action hash, it didn't say anything other parameters in addition to that? Yeah, uh, Jamal, my question was more related to, you know, once you have done that, later on right. you want to do a rebalance and what do you All do that. when you have to okay. do a rebalance? Yes. And is the rebalance uh, being done as a policy in the device or the driver, or is it something exposed? So, uh, so somebody could decide if a, if a new port is added or uh, removed, how do they want to balance that hash? I don't know, I wish one of, there's like four or five people involved in this work and none of them are here. And they were all, I mean, I copied them on the agenda. I think I may have missed somebody, but. Um, so I don't know the answer to that, but it's a good question. I think you would need to deal with that, right? Yes. Either that or you deal, you know, and, you know, uh, or flows go away or you have infinite amount of buckets, then, then it's probably not a very big problem. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, right. Jamal. I think yeah. Yeah. yeah so so I, I I have been I I did a poor job of managing the queue. There's a question from Marseille on uh, on the chat is asking if but do we have do we know what performance hit EBPF would have with the hashing? I don't know the answer to that. Is there any EBPF guru here. I mean, it, this this EBPF will just be a phony uh, hash algorithm that runs in software, but in reality, it's trying to be mimic what runs in so in hardware. So I think when somebody adds the TC rule, that rule will probably have like skipped software and it will go to hardware. Although, at least that's my understanding of it. Is anybody else has a different understanding of this? Yeah, I also think that it is just maybe only one packet of a flow will match that eBPF hash program, I think, right? The later packets will be offloaded to hardware. So okay, so, so it goes, the first packet goes to software and then that installs the that policy in the hardware. The hash. Yeah, set the hash in the SKB and then the TC, there is a filter rule that matches that hash and then offload it to to hardware so that the later packets will hit the hardware, I think. But doesn't that make it, uh, then you have to do per flow then after that, because you have to say this flow matches this SKB hash, right? Yeah, that's what I thought that they, he had two filters, right? The first filter was setting the hash and the second filter was matching on the hash and then redirecting. So, okay. Uh, Taras? Raise your hand. You, you 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 can go ahead, please. Yes. So I was wondering, uh, for example, two different devices uh, from two different vendors might have completely different hash, uh, even from the size perspective. So like 16, 16 or thirty two bits, and uh, keeping this keeping this in sync, that software. Okay, for ingress, we can we can definitely know. Okay, this one comes from that hardware. We should do that hash. But how to apply this for the egress, for me, it's completely unknown. I don't see how we can easily match two different hashes with two different sizes. Right. Anybody wants to chime in to that? I mean, yes, th these are attributes you have to know. You have to know what, when you specify hash, what does it mean? What does, which tuples it takes to create, uh, RSS, for example, is well known, even with RSS, uh, 
you could uh, still inject different seeds and have different results for RSS. As I think uh, that's what Angeli was hinting at. You know, if you put, uh, it's still the same five tuples, but different, you get different values if you use different seeds, right? And then is it, uh, I mean, and it's the tricks like that where symmetries, symmetric uh, hashes are used to identify different directions. So I, I'm, uh, Unfortunately, there's nothing much we can do here. So uh, it's time-wise, we still have about 10, 15 minutes. We, we can continue talking about it. I, I think it's, uh, so my concern was when these patches are posted, maybe we should uh, pivot to that question is, uh, they used flower for classifying a hash. And I, I raised the concern that, um, Flower tends to be so. If I now I have to add every other classifier, I have to extend it and make it do uh, have SKB hash as part of its classification. So I have to. If I'm using U32, I now have to extend U32. Uh, I was kind of concerned about that, and so I posted some patches as well to introduce a brand new classifier called uh, SKB hash, but for a lack of a better name. Uh, and I, so th that was one of the reasons I didn't want to go and change other classifiers I'm using. I'm not a big user of flower, for example. Uh, and the other thing is I, I didn't think the performance uh, would be the same because uh, the parsing in flower would be a little bit more expensive. Well, Nobody is, uh, should I start picking people to say something here? <laughs> Paul, do you say, uh, you probably need to separate, separate secondary tables for the different size hashes? Uh, in, the, in the example he was showing, it, he would have, he, he, he used two tables. The second table was the buckets. So if you had used different size hashes, you could just have set two different tables for that second step. They'd all map to the same egress ports, set of egress ports, but that might be one approach. Um, okay. And you're gonna have different, the, the, that, the, I'm assuming you're having different NICs, different input ports. So you're actually, your table def definitions would kind of be per port, I think anyway. So the, yes. the separate size hashes should, shouldn't necessarily be a problem, I think. So the, the, the separate hashes would, uh, what would be the impact? Is it a performance impact? Well, you might not get a, uh, the, your load distribution might not be as consistent because you you have different mechanisms for, for load balancing uh, particular five tuples, but they should still always map to the same, you know, to a buck, to a consistent bucket. So no matter what, you won't have an out of order, out of order problem. You'll just may have different load distribution taking place. I, I don't think it's necessarily a big problem that, that the, you have different size hashes. Seems like it's manageable in that architecture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so anybody from other Nick vendors who has Anjali or Jesse, uh, I see you there. Yeah, Jamal, sorry, I missed what was the question. No, I, I mean, are you guys, uh, what do you guys think of this uh, implementation, this uh, uh, talk, but specifically yeah, so to your hardware, basically? Right. So, so I mean, uh, definitely a good effort, but I think uh, there is more configuration that needs to be exposed, um, particularly as I uh, messaged on the chat side. You know, the seed rebalancing policy or exposure to hash buckets for balancing. And then the, uh, you know, I, I would also like the algorithm to be in kernel instead of, you know, through BPF. Uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, performance, uh, you know, depends on... Uh, yeah, so I mean, the way it is being done is like only the first packet uh, is used in software and then, uh, you know, the rest of it is in hardware, which is fine. Uh, and and uh, maybe in with that respect, you know, U32 versus Flower, I, I don't really know if uh, there is um, uh, any benefit to have because of course once it's offloaded, the performance is hardware performance. So yeah, but then I, I would, you know, feel comfortable if we had a little bit more configuration available. Uh, and, and by the way, I've just been informed that uh, the reason 
this gentleman are probably not here is because it's a weekend in Israel right now. <laughs> so they can be excused. Um, so your hardware though, Intel hardware, does, would this be useful? Yes, for sure. Which one? Because I have a lot of Intel hardware, XGBE or I40E? Sorry, I can't comment. <laughs> okay. But you're probably gonna add this functionality, yeah? Yes. All right, so I'm Marcelo from Red Hat, and this is a, a call to a brainstorm. When the action CT was added, it also added the, the, new, the new feature that say to TC that it started to defragment IP packets because it is needed to do proper contract on UDP packets. Even though the ICT was added because of hardware offload and IP fragments are hardly offloaded, we still have the TC software data path that we we strive to maintain a, a feature set in there that is well tied together. And then we now we have the problem. Once the packets are defragmented how we can output them. So XCT will, when packets are missing, uh, are triggering hardware miss, and it comes to software data path, it, they hit XCT, it is IP fragment, it's not reassembled yet. It will use the kernel stack that uh, we already have to do the fragmentation, the packets will be stolen until they are uh, fully reassembled. But once that big packet is returned by, by it, TC or more specifically Myriad's action can't output it because it has no knowledge today of how to fragment an IP packet. It just takes an SKB, it puts on a device queue and that's it. Um, what will happen is that the net device will reject because it's not the net device uh, responsibility to deal with this level of functionality. And we have no other action today that cannot put such packets. Yes, not considering act BPF. Uh, issue was noticed and patch was proposed by Wangso in upstream. The reference is there. And it was rejected by Kong Wang because in theory, TC is L2 and also shouldn't be messing with L3 stuff, more specifically fragmenting packets. But at the same time, TC is doing L3 stuff for quite a while. It is doing stateless net, it is classifying based on routes and other stuff. But Kong didn't want uh, the patch as was proposed. The current state Wengsu proposed a new patch, which got applied. It is enough to get it working with OVS, but only for it, because it relies on a chain miss so that the packet will be picked up by OVS. And then OVS will output it using its own kernel data path. So OVS will fragment the packet and put it out. But we still have this unbalance that we now can create such big packets on TC data path that can traverse TC actions and also the classifiers later on if we have a, a go-to chain. But TC can't output such packets on its own. And it would be very nice to have a fix for that. But this is a sample of the uses of the ACT CT. Uh, I believe you can see my mouse pointer. But if not, uh, this is the, it. okay, thanks. This is the, the first rule that would be matched once the pack triggers a missing hardware. It will do CT net here and just that. It will uh, do initial CT processing. This will, enough, will be enough to do packet reassembling and then go to chain two. Um, on chain two, 
if it is a new packet for a new connection, it will configure the net, save that on the contract entry and output it to a certain net device. So if it is, is a reassembled packet, this, this is the place that it will fail. It can't output packets here. And for then uh, subsequent packets for track it and establish states, uh, it's just outputs because the net was already handled here. Um, the current state realized that the chain two wouldn't exist or we would have a go to chain four or something that would trigger a miss. And then OVS will pick up the packet and output, but we, TC itself can't output it. And on a brainstorm on how to solve it, uh, so far we, we couldn't find a good way to, to solve it. There was some discussion on the initial thread in upstream, but uh, that led to nearly nowhere uh, to this day that I'm aware of. The main issue is that the C pipeline works with a single packet at a time. So ActCT can just return a list of packets because one could say that it is uh, ActCT responsibility to bring it back to the C semantics of one packet at a time, but it's not easy to be doable. We would have to handle multiple return codes on TCF, Action, Exec, and each packet can have its own control action. So it gets more recursive because we have to, to store the, the context for each packet that can flow anywhere else. Because we're not, once we fragmented it, we, we can't be certain that they will hit the same filters, the same actions and, and so on. And also because XAT needs the reassembled packet in a second moment, as we were seeing on the previous slide. Oh, we can, we, if we do this on the chain two in the, the example, it would have to reassemble the packet again and then disassemble so it can traverse the pipeline. No, not optimal. And uh, one proposal, one idea would be similar to Wengsu's original approach facing in act mirror itself, but only enable the feature. If the user say so, if we add a flag saying, yeah, you are allowed to fragment packets, so please fragment it. Or extending that, create a new, more explicit action, act L3 mirrored. So that, yeah, this is supposed to be doing L3 stuff. One other idea is to, user abused interface backlog, similar to reclassify, but doesn't need to hold context anymore because it is a brand new packet that the interface is receiving. It adds latency and reordering because now these packets are put back in the queue, but it's a few frags anyway, and we don't expect much performance out of it. And one thing to keep in mind uh, in here is that as we are dealing with uh, reassembled and fragmentation, I think PV fragmentation needed should be considered. Um, it would be nice to have them happening, although TC today has no idea about it. Uh, yeah, my question now is any other ideas, any paths that you think we, we could pursue here? Okay, so same deal. If you have a question, you can type it, Marcel will read it, or you can raise your hand and we'll allow you to speak. So, so Marcel, well, I, I, we're waiting for other people to ask, I'll ask. Um, I, I mean, um, the problem is you want to fragment, right? It doesn't seem like it belongs to an in, in act uh, uh, mirror, to be honest with you, because 
if the problem is fragmentation, this fragmentation will be needed in a lot of other places, right? It's, it should be a generic feature as opposed to... Um, uh, as opposed to um, s something that uh, is specific, right? To, so Act CT returns you this uh, big list of packets, right? No, it returns the reassembled packets. So the, the reassembled packet, and you want to you want to put it into smaller packets so you can send it out with the correct MTU. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And usually these uh, fragments then will go to the same destination, right? So if we are doing any tunneling and uh, we're pushing a VLAN tag on it, uh, we could be okay. doing on the assembled packets and fragment it later. So if there's an action that is called fragment packets and you want to put that fragment packets inside L uh, Mirad. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That action doesn't exist today, but it's something that we, it's an operation that we need to do. Yeah. So, so it's to fragment packets at L3 level, basically, into uh, Ethernet packets that will then be transmitted out, will then be mirrored, right? Or, or, or redirected. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that what ACT L3 mirrored is? Because in a loop, takes a big packet, fragments it, puts the proper Ethernet headers out, and off it goes. Or the other way, you can look at it as a, as a graph where it fragments and calls me red, right? Fragments slaps the Ethernet. Yep, L3 mirror could be a superset of mirrored, could be uh, even coded in the same C file, so you can reuse most of its code, but with that extra feature added. Right. Any, anybody else with a comment on this? Just raise your hand or put your question on, on chat. So the only concern I have is now we have two ways of doing this, right? Which uh, OVS has already invented their own way of handling it, right? And the OVS code is in the kernel, and now we have TC, which is lack, which needs this but is lacking, right? Um, yeah, I think you should look at it doing it as an action instead. Oh, uh, I to to maybe I don't know if this the result of this action the fragmented packets are only going to be needed for 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 mirroring and redirecting or for other maybe it could be fed into other actions as well, right? To my knowledge, other actions, they wouldn't have a problem dealing with such reassembled packets. And we even have uh, performance improvements by keeping it that way, because we are processing then one packet and not uh, several packets for the same actions. All right. Well, first off, hi, my name is Brianna Ausler. I'm an outreach intern this summer. Uh, working with mentors David Karate and Stefano Brivio. Uh, our project titled Improve and Extend Kernel Networking, Self-Test Running and Namespaces. And my project this summer is largely concerned with TDC. So I'm doing a quick TDC update about uh, the work that we did to add TDC to case self-test. Uh, TDC, as y'all probably know, is a suite of unit tests written in Python for traffic control. Um, so here on the slide, you can see that it was added by this patch as a target as uh, under the name TC testing at the self-test make file level. Uh, this work was done to align with the requirements outlined by Schwa Khan in a discussion on the LKML. Uh, I did provide a link below and I will be sending the PowerPoint presentation for upload. So, <clears> the <throat> work was done to align with that conversation and to comply with case self-test documentation. In that conversation, uh, Shua Khan is talking about integrating case self-test with kernel CI rings, and TDC is on a table that he has that describes where everybody is with respect to that work. 
uh, TDC was not yet a target of the main self test make file um, so that it could not be sort of evaluated. So the goal of this work was to add TDC to, uh, you know, make traffic control testing available at the self-test level for developers who test for regressions that might affect traffic control, as well as to increase awareness and traffic to TDC, encouraging contribution of new test cases and uh, introduce to it that opportunity to be run uh, by these larger CI projects. So here I provided, um, and I hope everybody can read it, uh, the make file that we introduced at the top level of the TC testing directory where TDC lives. So basically what I did here was merge the existing make file that makes BPS tests for TDC, or sorry, BPS object code files for TDC. Uh, I for that as test gen files, and then uh, we go ahead and export test progs because uh, we created a wrapper script to run TDC and then export the test files. Uh, why did we do a wrapper script? We did that basically so that we could avoid calling the build eBPS plugin that exports as the default action for actions tests that TDC do. Uh, to avoid running make over and over every time somebody tries to run so that if they export to a custom object directory uh, and of course self-test doesn't copy over the testing suite's make file, um, there's no breakage there. Uh, we also did that so that we could control the targets, only targeting actions and QDISC tests for now. Uh, filters is being updated to give it more complete testing coverage. Uh, so future goals are to better understand what those impacts are for bigger CI projects, understand what other work uh, needs to be done in TDC to uh, basically render it helpful for uh, that use case, and uh, just understand what other challenges or limitations are involved that might need to be addressed. Um, so uh, I went ahead and use some of these creative commons license uh, to make this PowerPoint. And uh, of course, we'd love your traffic and use cases in uh, TDC. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I noticed you've been finding bugs and fixing them uh, with TDC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kudos. Yeah, thanks. I, I, yeah, 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 so. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that, that's exactly right. You've been, Finding bugs, and then currently, what I'm I'm writing some tests for the CLS BPS control plane, and that work just isn't done in time for me to really talk about it today. But uh, hopefully, we'll be seeing some patches hitting the mailing list for that uh, in the next couple of weeks as well. Are we still having those uh, two or three week meetings, Michelle, with on TDC? I, I'm yes, sorry, I have. Oh, okay. I guess I've been I've been skipping. That. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I'm go let's open the for any discussions, but we're kind of chewing into break time right now. But uh, feel let's if anybody wants to talk, let's feel free to have this discussion. A a it's open mic time. Anybody anybody can talk about anything, as long as it's related to TC. Uh, I, I should point out there is a talk in this conference that's going to show how to do to invoke some of the socket layer code from XDP. All right, so the layer violation is not really a good reason. It's a purist point of view, in my opinion. Uh, sometimes you've got to be pragmatic and solve problems, you know, as opposed to I'm worried I'm doing this from TC and it's supposed to be L3 for a socket layer code, right? I'm um, said something on the chat. Right. Uh, that she agrees there was already C, C group level BPF programs uh, and the patch the patches from Wing Su for NetField and TC making it possible for them to use the tunnel flow block infrastructure of TCs. 
Oh, sorry, double muted. Uh, I don't know those patches. Sorry, I need to yeah. check them. Okay, and uh, I, I, you know what? Let's uh, let's just wrap it up here. Uh, thank you, everybody.